There's a sacrificial element in maturation, right? You have to sacrifice the pluripotentiality of childhood for the actuality of a frame. And the question is, well, why would you do that? Well, one reason is, it happens to you whether you do it or not. You can either choose your damn limitation, or you can let it take you unaware when you're 30, or even worse, when you're 40. And then, that is not a happy day. And you see, I see people like this, and I think it's more and more common in our culture, because people can put off mat maturity without suffering an immediate penalty. But all that happens is the penalty accrues, and then when it finally hits, it just wallops you. Because when you're 25, you can be an idiot. It's no problem. Even when you're out in a job search, it's like, well, you don't have any experience and you're kind of clueless. It's, yeah, yeah, you're young, you know, it's no problem. We can, that's what young people are like, but they're full of potential. Okay, well, now you're the same person at 30. It's like, people aren't so thrilled about you at that point. It's like, what the hell have you been doing for the last 10 years? Well, I'm just as clueless as I was when I was 22. It's, yeah, but you're not 22. You're an old infant. Right? And that's an ugly thing, an old infant. So, the, the re part of the reason you choose your damn sacrifice. Because the sacrifice is inevitable. But at least you get to choose it. And then there's a, something that's, that's even more complex than that, in some sense, is that the problem with being a child is that all you are is potential. And it's really low resolution. You could be anything, but you're not anything. So then you go and you adopt an apprenticeship, roughly speaking. And then you become, at least you become something. And when you're something, that makes the world open up to you again. You know, like if you're a really good plumber, then you end up being far more than a plumber, right? You end up being a good employer. Not, not that plumbers, I'm not putting plumbers down. It's like, more power to plumbers. They've saved more lives than doctors. So, hygiene, right? So, you know, if you're a really good plumber, well then you have some employees, you run a business, you, 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 make, you, you train some other people, you enlarge their lives, you're kind of a pillar of the community, you, you have your family. It's, you can, once you pass through that narrow training period, which narrows you and constricts you and develops you at the same time, then you can come out the other end with a bunch of new possibility at, hell, at hand. And Jung talked about that, he thought that the proper, part of the proper path of development in the last half of life was to rediscover the child that you left behind as you were apprenticing. And so then you get to be something and regain that potential at the same time. Very, very smart. Well, he was very, very smart. So that's very wise, very wise thing to know. So, yep. Sacrifice. And we'll, we'll talk more about that too. You get to pick your damn sacrifice. That's all. You don't get to not make one. You're sacrificial whether you want to be or not. That's a good thing to know as well. So even though it's rather, you know, it's a rough thing to figure out. You can go to university to not be something. Instead of going to university to be something. And, and that's, it's Pleasure Island. And the price you pay for it, especially in the US, is debt. And you're enticed into it because the administrators can pick your pocket. So they, they rob your future self while allowing you to pretend that you have an identity, right? Very nasty. And you can't declare bankruptcy with your student loans in the US. It's indentured servitude. And it, it is ple it's precisely Pleasure Island. It's exactly that. And so tuition fees have shot way out of control. And part of the reason that universities don't make more demands on their students and let them get away with all the th things they let them get away with is because they're basically, why the hell would you chase them out? They're $100,000 or more, so they can do whatever they want, as long as you get to sell them to the salt mines, right. So, and the, you know, it's not the only reason, because the other thing that's happened is that the rate of technological transformation is so fast now, and the rate of turnover of things is that it's, it is genuinely harder for people who are, say, 18 to 20. When I was a kid, roughly speaking, the kind of rough patch for, for, for life was probably 14 to 17, something like that. Now it's, I think it's 18 to 25, something like that. And I, I think the reason for that is, is that all the jobs that the bloody hippies complained about being doomed to in the 1960s have now disappeared. Their problem was, oh my God, I'm going to go have to work for a corporation and get a salary for the rest of my life. You know, and then I'll just end up 
in it with a pension and that'll be my whole life. It's like, well, it seems like a lot better deal than an endless round of part-time Starbucks jobs. So, you know, some of it is that. It's, it's just, it's, it's, there's a space now in our culture that, that is lacking for people to make that transformation from, from adolescence into adulthood. And so it's just, it's, it's, the cost of that is forestalled. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Do you think this is affecting uh, employers maybe in choosing younger people for a job? Are you saying that they, they're seeing this slower maturation or this, they're saying that this person's got a degree from U of T, but I've heard bad things that degrees aren't worth it? Well, the, there's a couple of problems with the degrees, is that everyone has one. That's the first one. Which, so because scarcity matters, obviously. Um, the second thing is, is that the match between the degree and the workplace has become less and less self-evident. You know, what should happen when you go to university is you should learn how to think and formulate arguments. You should learn to think, speak, and write. That's what the humanities are for. They're to make you dangerous, right? Because if you can think and speak and write, you're deadly. In a complex job, you're exactly what's necessary. But if you don't have that, it's like, what the hell good is the degree? So, I mean, degree in English literature doesn't prepare you for a job. It could make you think, write, and speak, which prepares you for any complex job, and that's what's supposed to happen. But increasingly, I think that doesn't happen. And the, the employers are waking up to this very rapidly. So, and they're, I mean, they've already known that most, for most complex positions, they have to train their people. Now they're thinking, well, why do I have to bother with the degree if I'm going to train them, if it isn't bringing anything of value? You see this in even in fields like law. We also seem to be tightly selected for the capacity to cooperate and compete, so that multiplies our cognitive ability. That's a huge part of it. And then we're also, we also seem to have constructed ourselves, so to speak, through sexual choice into these general problem general purpose problem solving creatures and so we've internalized some of the Darwinian process so you think well most animals will produce variants of themselves physically and then most of those variants die but human beings have built a lance built a mechanism let's say that's like a game engine I think that's a really good you know how there are game engines now that people have devised their, their, their computational devices and you can take a game engine and you can generate games with it, like computer games. So, um, the game engine is a mechanism for producing games. Well, that's what our brains are like. Our brains are game engines for producing games. And so, what happens is that, that when you think you produce an avatar of yourself, you produce a fictional world in, that that avatar inhabits, and maybe you produce multiple fictional worlds and multiple avatars. That's the you that could be tomorrow, which is what you're doing when you're planning and you walk the avatar through its potential roots and those that look good you keep and those that don't look good you kill and so you can then you can embody the ideas that you keep and act those out and hopefully the idea is that when you embody them you're successful and you don't get killed and so we're select we've also sele that when we've been selecting each other for cognitive prowess we've been selecting ourselves for the ability to generate avatars out of ourselves and kill them instead of dying. It's unbelievably brilliant. And, and that's really akin to the human discovery of the future. Right? The future is a place where variants of you could exist. It's something like that. And other animals don't seem to be able to do that. So, we're very sneaky. And, well, so far it doesn't seem to be working too badly, although we haven't been around for very long, right? I mean, human beings of our particular subspecies, about 150,000 years, something like that, which is from an evolutionary time frame, it's like, it's nothing, you know, it's 2,080 year old men, it's not very long, 